Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration will come to order. The Committee Legislative Assistant will take the roll. Chair Winkler. Winkler present. Representative Ekbaje. Present. Representative Barr. Here. Representative Doubt. Present. Representative Haley. Present. Representative Herr. Present. Representative Jordan. Present. Representative Lilly. Lilly present. Representative Long. Present. Representative Moran. Present. Representative Nash. Present. Representative New Brindley. Present. Representative Olson. Present. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski present. Representative Pryor. Present. Representative Volkamont. Present. There are 16 members present. Thank you, Ms. Vang. A quorum is present. The first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes for June 24th, 2021. Representative Badge. So moved. Representative Badge moves approval of the minutes for June 24th, 2021. Any discussion to that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The motion prevails and the minutes are approved for June 24th, 2021. The next item on the agenda this morning is House File 63. The chair moves that House File 63 be referred to the General Register. And there is a DE amendment, the A21-052. I'm going to move adoption of the DE. We can put it on the bill. And then I will ask the bill authors, uh, Representatives Mariani and Becker Finn, to present the bill in that form. Uh, so members, uh, the chair moves adoption of the DE, I'm sorry, moves adoption of House File 63 and moves uh, adoption of the A21-052 uh, author's amendment. Discussion to that motion. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion prevails and the DE amendment is adopted. So, Representative Mariani and Representative Becker Finn, uh, if you could please present your bill as amended. I would like to say, members, that we are going to take approximately uh, 20 minutes uh, for the authors to present the bill and about 20 minutes for member questions. The reason we are uh, in this format and in this timeline is that we, uh, in order to uh, close out the session in an orderly manner before July 1, we need to have this bill calendared for Tuesday, which means uh, it has to be done by noon today. The 1030 session is when the bill will get its second reading, and then the 24-hour rule for amendments will be set before noon today uh, with uh, passage scheduled for Tuesday. Uh, and the bill is before the Rules Committee. It's an unusual uh, method for us to pass it, but it allows us to uh, get the bill calendared for Tuesday without a four-hour rule, which is required for ways and means. So. Uh, Representative Mariani, I think you're, you will start and then we'll go to Becker, or, uh, Representative Becker Finn, unless the two of you would like to have a different order. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, members. That, that, that order is fine. I suspect we'll, uh, we'll go back and forth um, here. So this is the um, uh, Public Safety um, Corrections uh, Judiciary um, Omnibus uh, Finance Bill. Um, Pretty much all the provisions in this bill are provisions that this body has seen and deliberated over a period of several months um, involving uh, literally dozens of, of committee hearings uh, between both of us. Um, we, uh, the House passed uh, most of these provisions uh, during the regular session. We went to conference uh, with the other body. Um, and uh, we're unsuccessful in arriving at agreement um, with them uh, through no lack of effort on the part of the House that made five offers during that period of time and received no offers uh, at that time. Uh, we since uh, have been uh, constantly um, in talks with uh, the other body, including once we went into a special session um, and began um, in more earnest exchanging ideas uh, with one another. Um, I and the uh, chief chair of the uh, Senate uh, committee got to a certain point um, in um, our work um, and basically reached an impasse uh, at that time. Um, uh, the conversations continued with um, leadership of both bodies um, um, at the table. And so what you have here before you, um, even though it is uh, mostly um, 
the information that, um, or rather, uh, the provisions that we have uh, have engaged in uh, for many months um, uh, represents the, um, uh, for the most part, the agreements between uh, uh, both bodies of leaders. Um, on the uh, public safety and corrections side, I'll speak to that uh, briefly, and I'm sure my colleague, uh, Chair Beckerfin, uh, will uh, want to talk about the judiciary uh, aspects. Um, uh, right off the bat, as you all know, uh, law enforcement uh, issues in terms of accountability were uh, a major uh, public uh, expectation and driver uh, of this bill. Um, there are um, some uh, police accountability um, uh, provisions within the bill, uh, certainly uh, nowhere near uh, what the House had uh, prepared and compromised and had forwarded um, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the other body. Um, there are uh, some important uh, agreements around continuing to strengthen the post board's ability to build the um, intervention system that we authorized it uh, to do uh, last summer. Um, there are also some uh, smaller uh, provisions having to do with the conduct of, 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 uh, of law enforcement relative to um, um, uh, how they handle uh, their uh, informants, um, as well as um, continuing to beef up the 911 uh, capacity and um, and expectations in our state to involve uh, mental health um, uh, interveners uh, on calls. Um, that's pretty much as far as we were able to get with um, uh, with police accountability measures. It's a great disappointment to me. It should be a great disappointment uh, to the House. So there were a number of common sense um, uh, proposals. Uh, some that enjoyed um, elements of bipartisan support, uh, many that actually um, were informed uh, by law enforcement uh, themselves. The bill also addresses um, um, prison and jail safety um, in our state. Um, we heard uh, horrific testimony uh, of a family who lost a loved one through uh, sheer negligence um, um, and uh, quite frankly, in my opinion, malice on the part of uh, local jailers. Um, and so I really um, compelled the department as well as uh, the House to forward a proposal for modernizing our uh, oversight uh, as a state uh, with our uh, jails, but also in our prisons uh, to ensure constitutional rights of, of safety for those in detention um, are adhered to. This is known as the um, um, uh, uh, hardell Sherrill Act. Um, there is a uh, powerful, uh, innovative uh, first, um, um, or a powerful new innovative uh, program uh, created to uh, protect um, and um, help uh, our state's firefighters. Uh, many of you know that uh, most of our firefighters in our state are volunteer uh, firefighters and they work for very small uh, units. Um, uh, as such, um, they uh, uh, have minimal access to all sorts of, of interventions and um, supports uh, when they suffer uh, what they suffer as a, as a result of their work. They have high rates of cancer, card cardiology, or cardiological uh, illnesses, and mental health uh, issues, uh, again, due to the nature of their work. Um, this uh, program um, will provide support uh, for those families, uh, for those individuals and their families as they deal uh, with those issues. Uh, there are uh, a few grant programs uh, in the Office of Justice Program uh, that are worth noting. Uh, one is an investment in uh, community innovations, um, which al allows for uh, community-based groups to uh, receive resources and guidance from the state as they step up to uh, work on anti-violence uh, prevention efforts in their own uh, community. It's a critical component of advancing uh, public safety and addressing crime issues to have locals um, uh, local citizens uh, participating 
uh, in that kind of prevent, preventive work. There's also a grant program for uh, specifically for survivors of, of, uh, of uh, criminal, crime, criminal sexual crimes. Um, um, there's a huge, huge need uh, across the state, uh, everywhere, uh, for uh, these victims, these survivors, um, to have resources to put their lives back together um, and to move forward. Um, and so we're uh, creating a grant program uh, that will, uh, uh, on top of the regular victim services assistance that we do uh, to help uh, them. There are major changes in our criminal sexual uh, conduct uh, statutes. Um, this is as a result of a um, task force that's been working for two years. Um, it was a bipartisan uh, bill that we passed a couple of years ago. They came back with having done an extensive review of our criminal sexual um, uh, statutes, uh, including some increased uh, penalties uh, for certain uh, crimes, uh, addressing um, um, some holes um, uh, in our, our, um, our uh, uh, prosecution uh, of certain uh, types of criminal sexual um, uh, conduct. Um, and uh, this effort has been led um, here in, in, in the House by Representative Kelly Muller. Um, and uh, 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 it, it, it matched up with uh, a bill that the Senate uh, also passed. Uh, there are a number of appropriations uh, throughout uh, the bill to, uh, that respond to um, both uh, supporting uh, law enforcement uh, as well as supporting communities, uh, supporting survivors, um, and continuing uh, our efforts to do reform work, particularly in our corrections uh, system, addressing uh, the need to uh, modernize the formula uh, for our probation uh, systems. Um, it doesn't do that, uh, but it does set up the ability uh, for us uh, to do that. The bill itself uh, meets the target uh, set for it uh, as agreed to uh, by our leadership and as a balanced uh, bill. I'll stop there and um, uh, ask my colleague, uh, Chair Becker Finn, uh, to uh, weigh in. Thank you, Representative Mariani. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I will be going over the judiciary portions of the bill. Um, so if, if you, I'm going to start with the spreadsheet. So this compromise language uh, includes a two and a half percent raise for judges and court employees starting uh, in the first year of the biennium. Um, also includes 500,000 for courthouse security grants. That's been an ongoing program. This um, funds it for an additional year. Uh, we also were, there are significant increases for civil legal aid and the public defenders. Um, also related to, uh, and as uh, folks who are familiar with the, both these areas know the demand and the need um, for civil legal services. Uh, we, uh, we have never uh, funded that to the degree that we need to. This um, doesn't quite get us there, but it, it makes an important investment. Um, the public defenders, of course, we are constitutionally required Required as a state to provide public defenders for folks who cannot afford their own attorneys. Um, they have been overworked and underpaid um, since we first had public defenders. So um, these, these increases are really, really important. Um, another really important provision uh, that came from the House side uh, was an in increase in interpreter pay. We have not increased the rate of pay for court interpreters. Uh, for significantly for over 20 years. Uh, we, um, this includes uh, an additional uh, $400,000 uh, to go towards that. Um, it's again, not enough, but it is something. Um, we also include the funding that there's an ad additional judge unit needed um, due to those uh, criminal sexual conduct changes in the law that needed to happen after the recent Supreme Court case. Um, our bill also funds the guardian ad litem, the tax court, uniform law commissions, board of judicial standards. Um, those are kind of the, the big funding areas, uh, as well as the Department of uh, Human Rights. Uh, there is some additional funding here. There was an ask for four additional FTEs. Um, uh, 
they essentially don't have the staff to keep up with the the need uh, for processing caseloads in an efficient manner. Um, we were able to uh, agree on one additional FTE in this bill. Um, as far as the policy, uh, other really important reforms, uh, some that have been worked on for many, many years that are included in this bill uh, are uh, reducing or waiving the traffic and criminal surcharge. Uh, this was Representative Frazier's bill. This is uh, this will take uh, take effect in the second year of the biennium, but then is is ongoing, um, as well as uh, this bill also includes the civil asset forfeiture language that was worked on by uh, Representative Mueller and Senator Johnson. Um, again, really important reforms that many folks um, on both sides of the aisle have been working on for a very long time. Uh, we also authorize public defenders to apply for interpreter services from the court. Um, and uh, I'm just going through my list here. And then uh, another, another key piece that we agreed on uh, was language around the processing of U visas uh, and being able to do that, uh, setting some parameters so that that's done um, efficiently uh, statewide and that there's uh, better processes to make sure that those are processed in a timely manner, which is something that's uh, supported both by uh, by folks on both sides of the aisle as well as uh, as law enforcement. Um, we also have the jailhouse witness provisions, uh, which were championed by uh, Representative Long, uh, as well as some updates to uh, some policy updates requested by the Department of Human Rights. There are a few data provisions, um, small provisions, but, but important uh, in keeping the minor uh, data on minors uh, private as it should be. Uh, and then uh, the Uniform Probate Code, which is a very boring thing, um, but was passed off the Senate floor and is included in this bill, uh, and um, some increases on the fees for cert certificate of compliance to make sure the Department of Human Rights can effectively do their work and uh, hold folks accountable um, when there are bad actors. Um, that's the really quick run through of the judiciary side of the bill. There are obviously uh, a handful of other things that I didn't get to, but um, do want to make sure we have uh, time for for questions, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Becker Finn. I want to thank both you and uh, Representative Mariani for really tireless dedication to this bill. I know that uh, this is not just uh, a special session bill. This is more than a year in the making to bring this bill forward. And uh, negotiations have been very challenging. And we are coming through uh, with this DE uh, in rules, which is unusual. So I want to thank you for your flexibility. And I really want to emphasize for members and for the public that this bill is being revealed, uh, its language revealed. Uh, the intention of the House is to take it up on the floor on Tuesday. That means that there is a deadline for noon tomorrow for amendments to be posted to fix any technical errors or make any uh, last minute changes agreed to between the House and Senate. And as a result, uh, we should have uh, at least uh, 28 hours before amendments are due for people to review the bill and look for any uh, changes or needs uh, technically. And then we will have 24 hours thereafter uh, before we are taking it up on the floor. If this were a, a regular session, this agreement would come out in a conference committee. It would be voted out of conference, sent to the floor. Or there would be no opportunity to review or make changes. And so uh, it's unfortunate that we are pushing up so close against a state government shutdown on July 1st, uh, but this process does allow some flexibility at the end, which I think will help make sure we don't make any last minute mistakes. Um, members, I, uh, I think we are open up for questions. So if you would use your raise hand function, I will recognize you for questions for the bill authors. And this is the rules committee. Members are not used to doing this, so we'll just give them a minute to see if they can find that button. I am not seeing member questions. R Representative Olson B. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So my one question, I guess I missed it. I know that Representative Mariani went through some real quick, but what are the new regulations, rules, or restrictions that are being placed on our law enforcement as regards to this bill? Representative Mariani. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, but uh, Representative Olson's comments faded at the end for me. So if you can repeat the question. I appreciate it. Representative Olson. 
Yeah, sorry for, for that, Representative Mariani. I'm wondering what are the new restrictions, rules, or regulations that are being placed on our law enforcement aid uh, officers and peace officers as a result, result of this bill? Representative Mariani. Representative Olson, if you can uh, point me to a line somewhere where we're restricting uh, a law enforcement officers in the state of Minnesota, I'd be glad to answer your question. Thank you. I would love to do that. I, I'm sorry, but I am incapable of reading hundreds of words per minute. This is a 223-page document. This amendment is huge, and we received it at 1.43 in the morning. So I'm wondering if you can provide... I think you actually might have called them something interesting. Um, you called them something fancy like accountability or something like that. Can you, maybe if I rephrase it and instead of saying restrictions, maybe if I call them police accountability, will you be able to answer that please? Representative, Thank also there's nothing fancy about the word accountability. Um, you know, let me, uh, let me spare you um, reading the bill if you don't want to read the bill. Uh, there's nothing in this bill that restricts the ability of law enforcement officers to carry out their functions consistent with, with the Minnesota Constitution and the standards under which they are licensed by our, our uh, post board, um, our state licensing board. Um, I don't know any other way to answer um, uh, that question for you. Representative Becker Finn, were you seeking recognition on this question? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I will say that our current law does uh, currently restrict law enforcement officers who work for tribal governments, and we had actually tried to fix that provision um, for the Leech Lake Nation, but the Senate GOP was not amenable to doing that. So um, we could have uh, increased the ability of law enforcement officers to uh, enforce criminal law in our state, but the Senate was not willing to do that. Representative Badge. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Representatives Mariani and Becker Finn. I know you guys worked very hard on uh, getting us to a bill to this point. Um, I guess I have maybe one question for each of you. Uh, for Chair Mariani, um, if you would, I think you mentioned earlier that there were maybe some um, measures that were supported by police, but that didn't make it into the bill and um, if there's any future steps on how to continue to move on those things that police officers had said that they had wanted. Um, and then for Chair Becker Finn, um, in terms of the increases in funding for civil legal aid and for public defenders, uh, does that civil legal aid also cover um, you know, additional funding maybe for additional attorneys for uh, groups like uh, Minnesota Medical Aid and, and other services that we have around, or is that just the matches to federal funding? All right, so we'll start with Representative Mariani. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative uh, Agbaje. We, we actually held uh, quite a few conversations, uh, as this chair has done throughout the entire uh, session. Um, you know, my, my approach to legislating is to make, to make sure that all stakeholders uh, are involved um, in the uh, deliberations uh, that we have here. I opened up our committee um, so that um, there was a broader array of Minnesotans uh, constantly at our table. Uh, it's a key feature uh, of, our, of our particular uh, committee. Uh, among them were uh, law enforcement uh, uh, representatives. At times, those have been, um, quite frankly, uh, tough um, and uh, sometimes stressed uh, conversations. Uh, however, uh, thanks to their professionalism and thanks to ours, uh, we kept at the table with one another uh, and continue to shape up uh, many of the bills. Two of the bills in particular that uh, we made some really good progress uh, on were um, uh, a couple of bills that actually had bipartisan support with Sam Devotny uh, helped to shape uh, one of the traffic uh, stops related bills uh, that flowed from the um, uh, police killing of Dante Wright uh, just uh, you know, weeks ago. Um, there was a, a quite a bit of um, earnest uh, problem solving uh, that we did relative to uh, what kind of, of currently primary offenses that would warrant a stop uh, could um, uh, be recategorized as secondary, secondary offenses. Um, um, I have to say, I and the conferees uh, learned quite a bit uh, from our law enforcement 
uh, folks um, uh, had some good appreciation for what they were dealing with. Uh, and I think they also felt much more comfortable with what we were trying to do. Uh, unfortunately, that language <clears throat> did not make it uh, relative to the Senate's uh, willingness to entertain it, uh, probably due to the fact that, that the Senate uh, held not a single hearing on uh, the preeminent issue of our age uh, throughout its entire you know, several months of, 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 uh, of being in session. There was also a lot of work around body camera um, uh, uh, regulations. Um, those, uh, 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 there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, I think we got to a fairly comfortable spot uh, with law enforcement uh, representatives uh, on that. Uh, there seemed to be little disagreement that in the case of, of, of someone dying uh, at the hands of a peace officer, whether you know, it was justified or not, that uh, the Mexican uh, should have a right to be able to view uh, that video in, in an appropriate period of time. The question became, how long is that period of time? And uh, the need for law enforcement to conduct uh, proper objective investigation really was our, our guiding uh, uh, framework uh, for that. Um, and we were moving uh, pretty effectively in terms of narrowing down you know, specific days, uh, et cetera. Again, the Senate uh, would not entertain uh, that kind of, 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 of proposal. There's a lot of shaping around the no-not uh, warrants, uh, which is in the bill. Um, the approach that the House initially had was just to ban these incredibly dangerous uh, procedures. Uh, we were convinced uh, that um, there uh, uh, could well be rare instances where, uh, unfortunately, they're warranted. Uh, and so the posture of the House, uh, and again, this came from interacting with law enforcement, the posture of the House then was to uh, use a regulatory uh, scheme for regulating uh, the uh, process and uh, the instances in which uh, no-nots uh, would be used. Um, greatly thankful for our law enforcement uh, community for informing us on how to do this uh, in a much more uh, responsible way that we do have uh, uh, in, uh, in the bill before us. There were discussions and several others. Uh, there were some areas where we just simply did not agree. Um, and those um, uh, also did not make it into the bill. Representative Becker Finn, the second question, I assume you have it down. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I did write it down. Uh, uh, your question is about the funding for civil legal services. So it is an increase aimed at improving the access of low-income clients. So um, those individual, uh, the way civil legal aid is set up um, around our state, those individual, you know, they can decide whether that uh, improving access, you know, it's, so it may mean some increases for folks, but uh, would also include hiring uh, more staff so that we can serve uh, more Minnesotans. Any uh, federal funds uh, that have been applied for by uh, legal services within Minnesota um, through the ARP dollars, that would be completely separate from what we're doing here. The need is there even without the pandemic. Um, and so this, this increase will, will stand and is ongoing. Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair and to Chair Mariani. Uh, as Chair Winkler had noted, this is an unusual methodology to effectively debate this bill in the Rules Committee. And not having had the benefit of any of our uh, members on the conference committee, and that was done with the, the two chairs and partly, I think, some of the tribunal, I'm trying to figure out, is the totality of your DE, is that exactly the same language that the Senate is going to be taking up? Or have you put some things in your DE that are not in the Senate version of this bill? And I'll have a follow up. Representative Mariani. Representative Nash, um, um, just to, um, I suppose, very quickly answer uh, your question. Um, there will be uh, some sub substantive and technical amendments that will need to come forward um, uh, for tomorrow. Um, mostly technical, but there are um, a, a small uh, set of, of items that are still not uh, in total agreement uh, uh, between the two bodies. Um, and if that being the case, you know, uh, logic would dictate that we remove uh, those provisions um, um, 
if we want, want to be able to proceed uh, with the bill. Um, so uh, that is still, um, there's still fluidity, um, you know, on a number of those provisions uh, before us. Representative Nash, I do believe that the Senate will be moving forward with this language to start. They're not two different versions of the bill that we're starting with. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. And the quick follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair Mariani, uh, I guess there are times that I miss being on your committee, and I appreciate the, the heavy nuance that you put into some of your answers, much like we just got. You said that there will be some technical but some substantive and obviously uh, trying to figure out what those are. And it's awfully difficult to have been on the floor for days and days and days and then in quite quite literally the dark of night at 140, I think it was 141, this bill language rolled in from Mr. Blavet and uh, the, the rules packet. It's terribly difficult to digest something this large in uh, this little bit of time, but your substantive and I'm doing air quotes, uh, what, are your, what are your substantive fixes or changes that you uh, are, are going to be amending in? Uh, just, I'm sure you're gonna wanna be transparent and tell us what those are. So what, what uh, will you be pursuing? Representative Mariani. Representative Nash, we miss you too on the uh, committee. We had some uh, interesting back and forth uh, together. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, and you also made some substantive, um, um, helpful um, additions to the work uh, that uh, that we did back then. Um, you know, I, I'm not trying to um, you know be opaque here. Um, the the nature of any negotiation is that uh, there's going to be constant changes in terms of of whether we can get to an agreement on something. Uh, that's what I would call substantive. If we can't get to agreement on, um, you know, for instance, important body cam language, uh, then it will certainly my, be my intention um, uh, not to attempt to move that uh, forward. Um, and so um, I, I hear your frustration. Uh, try being on the floor all night uh, uh, and also negotiating this bill, which is what I was doing. Uh, of course, I was there virtually. Uh, but it's certainly still required hours of my attention to the important nature of our work on the floor while also trying to negotiate this bill. And so, um, you know, uh, those amendments will come forward, um, you know, tomorrow and then we'll debate them. And just before you go, Representative Nash, I'd just like to say for the public's benefit, all amendments will be posted on the House website for 24 hours before the bill is taken up on the House floor. So there will be no surprises on the floor about what amendments uh, can be taken up or will be taken up. Uh, the Senate does not have that rule. Uh, and so uh, if you are interested in the final form of this bill uh, as it comes out of the House, watch the House website where those amendments are posted. Representative. Then, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And a question for you, given that it, it seems as though there are likely to be morphologically two very different bills potentially from the Senate and this bill. What is your recommendation as leadership from the House as to how these are going to be reconciled in a very short period of time? Obviously, standing up a conference committee to reconcile the differences seems the most logical approach, but just trying to figure out what you as leadership are, are saying to ourselves and the public as to what is the pathway forward for this to become law before uh, July 1st. Representative Nash, the intention is to align the House and Senate versions of the bill in the next uh, 24 to 36 hours so that they will be the same when they finally uh, come to passage in the House and Senate. Well, I look forward to uh, a substantive and thorough conversation on the floor. I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to put that certain, together. I'm certain you can deliver that, Representative Nash. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is probably is actually for nonpartisan staff. So I don't know if that is Mr. Johnson for this committee or who that might be. Mr. But I'm Johnson. wondering, I'm wondering, um, I and I've been furiously scrolling the bill. Um, and, and again, time is just short on this. So I'm wondering if you can um, direct me to, to the portion or portions of the bill 
that deal with police accountability measures and what those might be in this language. Mr. Johnson, are you able to address the question from Representative Greenlee? Mr. Chair, this is Jeff Diebel from House Research. Thank Mr. you. Diebel, please proceed. Yes, so, so the, article, the last article of the DE is, uh, covers policing regulation and reform or any, any uh, piece that impacts uh, policing. So if you uh, go to Article 9, and I, I hate to um, be evasive, but I, I don't, uh, the term accountability is somewhat of a politically charged term. So I can point to you to directly to the pieces that impact policing, and I'll leave it to you whether it uh, relates to accountability or not. That's perfect. Thank you. So Article 9 is entitled Policing and Corrections. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Newbrindley. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Dibble, would you just direct me to what page section or Article 9 starts on? Do you, do you have that? Yes, uh, yes Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair and Representative, it's uh, page 193. Perfect. Thank you. So the, the first few sections of that article are uh, pieces of a post-board policy bill. This is an agency bill. And so sections uh, one and uh, two, and I'm, I'm scrolling through it here for you. We, we were working on this late last night as well. Um, And the, yeah, so those are the, from the piece from the post board agency bill that they brought forward. And then the section four of the, bear with me here. I apologize, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, no, you're, you're fine. I'm just uh, scrolling through the document to make sure I cover all the pieces you're interested in. And section four is another piece from the, Post Board Agency Bill, and that relates to implementing the proposal from last year regarding the Discipline Review Board at the Post Board, so that the conforming change to legislation that was enacted last summer by the legislature. I'm sorry, that's Section 3. Bear with me. The, the other pieces of this article relate to corrections. So there's um, Representative Dubrinley, did you intend follow-up questions after you hear which sections of the bill uh, you're looking for? Um, I, I'm sorry. Was Mr. Dibble done? Uh, I just, I, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm covering all the sections, uh, Representative. Bear with me. There, well, many of the sections relate to the uh, corrections reform pieces. There is um, on section 23 on page uh, 215, that's the no-knock um, search warrant reform piece. The uh, section 24 is another piece from the post board policy reform bill, and that's a technical change. Um, the section 25 is also from the post board reform bill. That That is a technical amendment to clean up the uh, how the members, certain members of the advisory council that was created last year for the post board are appointed. Uh, and then again, section 26 is also from the post board reform bill. That's on page 217. And then the piece, uh, section 27, relates to sharing of data 
on police officer conduct with the post board. And that's an amendment to a provision that was enacted last summer as part of the uh, agreement uh, with the Senate. What, what page is that? That's uh, page 218. Thank you. We are, Mr. Go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Sorry. Yeah, I'm almost done, Mr. Chair. So section 29 is the confidential informant required policy. That's the model policy that all agencies would be required to adopt. And then the final section is rule 31. That's also from the post board's uh, policy reform bill. And that uh, concludes the placing pieces in that article. Representative New Brindley, any follow-up? We are uh, needing to move forward in order to get this bill prepared for uh, floor action. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so it sounds like, just for clarification, um, any changes are from that original post board language or the, um, the no-knock warrant stuff. Does, is that accurate? Mr. Diebel? Uh, well, the chair, Mr. Chair and, and members, the chair, Mariani, can correct me. Uh, there are some uh, pieces regarding funding that are in Article 1 that the chair discussed in his overview um, related to body cameras. Sure. And, uh, yeah. and Mr. Chair, this is... Mr. Johnson? Uh, just uh, Mr. Diebel, during his walkthrough, also mentioned the confidential informant policy, and uh, Representative Brindley's question did not include that. Thank you. Representative, Re Representative New Brindley. So, um, so, so my last question then is that is there is, it's, you, you mentioned that there is model language included. However, you also said that all agencies will be required to adopt that. Will they be required to adopt the quote model language or will they be required to adopt a policy and they have the example of the model language. Representative New Brindley, who are you addressing that question to? Uh, let's let's uh, direct that to Chair Mariani. I'm guessing he would probably uh, be most well versed in that. Representative Mariani. Thank you, Representative New Brindley. Um, yeah, we're following the standard format under which model policies are created, uh, regardless of what the issue is, uh, which is that it, it sets a standard. And um, um, uh, typically, in this case, at the post board, um, local entities then are required to uh, adopt and or adjust their uh, policies if they currently have them uh, to be consistent with the standards set by the post board. Um, uh, so they can have their own local policies as long as that they're not violating the standards and the expectations uh, of the model policy. Uh, they also have the option uh, to simply adopt the model policy uh, at the post board. Uh, many entities will tend to do that uh, just because of the uh, enormous amount of work sometimes that it takes to uh, be able to do that. Um, but that's, yeah, that's the general approach to, you know, so it's a balance between making sure that there's this local uh, wisdom uh, and autonomy relative to applying uh, policies to conditions on the ground, but making sure that as they do that, they're meeting um, uh, quality standards established by this professional board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Jordan, I will give you the last question or comment, and then we will proceed to a vote. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My question, <clears throat> excuse me, is for Chair Becker Finn, um, relating to the African American women and indigenous relatives uh, workforces. Um, or not workforces, uh, working, sorry, I'm not used to asking questions like this um, in rules that morning. Oh, I'm asking about the missing and murdered indigenous and African American women task forces. Um, I'm glad to see we have appropriations for those on um, pages 13 and 15, and then policy language on 41 and page 71. But Chair Beckerfin, my question is, can you actually talk about how that would work and what that would actually do to reduce um, instances of missing and murdered um, African-American and, indig and indigenous people. Um, you know, we do a lot of things where we, we talk about the issue, but what will this actually do to these task forces and working groups do to prevent more instances of these crimes? Representative Becker-Finn. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Jordan, for the question. So in the case of uh, missing and murdered uh, Indigenous relatives, uh, this bill sets up a uh, permanent office uh, with four full-time staff that will be tasked uh, with addressing these issues. We have a very thorough report that came out of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women uh, Task Force that we funded two years ago. Uh, so they're, they're two separate issues. Uh, and in the case of Missing and Murdered Indigenous relatives, uh, there are some complex jurisdictional issues um, and uh, that we'll have to deal with that overlap with the, the, the federal government as well as uh, historically different, uh, different things that have happened in our state. So this will address all of those things, both looking forward and the ability to look at cold cases and, and missing uh, women and children. And of course, has been uh, highlighted by what has been uncovered in Canada uh, with the residential schools and the the, um, the thousands of, of children who have been discovered. And um, that important work uh, will also need to happen uh, in Minnesota in addition to, uh, you know, uh, Indigenous women being more likely to be victims of homicide, sexual assault, and, and other types of violence. Uh, the Missing and Murdered African Women Task Force is, is at stage one. Uh, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives is at, as at stage two. So we were able to fund that bill. It was a Representative Richardson initiative. And the important thing about it is that the task force process will engage the community. So uh, at the end of that process, we will know um, and have a better idea of what they recommend needs to happen for things to change. And so uh, that will be remain to be seen so we can allow that process to occur with input from the community. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Representative Jordan. Thank you, Representative Becker Finn and Representative Mariani. Uh, we are prepared now to go to a vote. Uh, the, the motion before us is that House File 63, as amended, be referred to the General Register. And uh, uh, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. 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 The motion prevails, and House File 63, as amended, is referred to the General Register. Uh, members, because we have to calendar this bill for Tuesday after the bill gets its second reading this morning, we will be in recess until uh, later today, but it will be before noon. Uh, Representative Barr, I see your hand is up. Uh, if you could... Uh, ask your question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what are you planning for floor session on Monday? Is that we going to have anything to debate, um, anything to go over, or is that more of a paper push? Representative Barr, we may have a jobs conference report to process. And just for members' information, uh, we have four bills outstanding uh, for the House to still pass, public safety, the jobs conference report, taxes and state government. So those four bills are on the agenda this week. Uh, timing uh, still to be determined for all of those. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, okay, members, we are in recess and staff will send around a new link for the hearing. Thank you.